fascinating to me how, 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 uh, how the, you know, the really great universities operate in this respect. They, uh, uh, if you get a sacred writ, I mean, you get in the finance department because you sign on you know, to whatever the present group thinks. And if they think the world is flat, you better think the world is flat too. You know? And your students better answer that the world's flat when they get a, a, on exams. And I, I would say investment finance teaching in this country is, is uh, in general, is kind of pathetic. Yeah. A huge majority of the business school teaching on the field of investment of passive portfolios of securities is not what we believe and not what Warren was taught years ago by Ben Graham. Uh, they're just little pockets of, of uh, our attitude left. There's one at Stanford, Jack McDonald. Yeah, sure. And uh, that, Yeah, that's graduate school. It's but, graduate but, school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that is I think it's the most popular course in the whole Stanford Business School. They've got some kind of a bidding system. And yet I asked Jack how he felt, and he's, he, he said he felt lonely. <laughs> he's got the most popular course, but in the whole professoriate dealing with investment matters, the Jack McDonald's are a little clan of their own in a, in a side pocket, so to speak. Now, they're right. And they can have, take whatever consolation they get from that. But, but mostly if you go to business school, you will learn a lot of things we don't believe. I mean, what you really want a course on investing to be is how to value a business. That's, that's what the game is about. I mean, it, if you don't know how to value a business, you don't know how to value a stock. And if you look at what is being taught, uh, I think you see very little of how to value a business. And, and the rest of it is playing around maybe with numbers or, you know, uh, Greek symbols or something of the sort, but, but it, it doesn't do you any good. I mean, in the end, you have to decide, you know, whether you're going, whether you're going to value a business at, at $400 million or $600 million or $800 million, and then you compare that with the price. And that's, that's what investing is. And I don't know any other kind of investing, you know, basically to do. And there, that just isn't taught. And the reason it isn't taught is because there aren't teachers around, you know, who, who know how to teach it. I mean, they don't know themselves. And since they don't know themselves, they teach something that says nobody knows anything, and, which is the efficient market <laughs> theory. And, and if I didn't know how to do it, and if I ever teach physics, I'm going to come up with a theory that nobody knows anything, because it's the, it's the only, only way I can get through the day, you know. But uh... <laughs> Well, I think the business schools do a pretty good job when it comes to accounting, oh, accounting or... Sure, sure or personnel management, or uh, uh, there are a whole lot of subjects I think they do quite well with, but they miss one enormous opportunity. If you learn to think intelligently about how to invest successfully in businesses, you'll become a much better business manager than you will if you aren't good at, at uh, understanding what's required for successful investment. So they're missing a huge opportunity to improve the management profession by doing such a lousy job in teaching investment. Yeah, see, Charlie and I see CEOs all the time who, who in a sense don't know how to think about the value of businesses they're acquiring. And then, you know, so they go out and, and hire investment bankers and guess what? The investment banker tells them what to do, uh, tells them to do it because they get 20x if they do it, and x if they don't do it. And guess how the advice comes out. So, it it's uh, when a manager of a business feels helpless, which he won't say out loud, but 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 inwardly feels helpless in in, in the question of asset allocation. You know, you've got a real problem. And and there aren't they have not gone to business schools that have given them any real help. I think in in terms of learning how to think about valuation in businesses and. You know, that's one of the reasons that, that we write and talk about it some, because it's, there, there's a gap there. The priesthood, uh, say 30 years ago, for example, in terms of, or 40 years ago, in terms of efficient market theory, they, they, 
they strayed pretty far, in, in, in our view, from the reality of investing. And I would rather have a person, if I could hire somebody among the top five graduates of number one, two, or three of the business schools, and my choice was somebody that had uh, was bright, but had chapter eight of the intelligent investor, absolutely, it just was natural to them. They had it in their bones, basically. Um, I, I, take, I take the person from chapter eight. It, it, this is not, what we do is not a complicated business. It's gotta be a disciplined business, but it, is, it does not require a super high Q or anything of the sort. Uh, and um, there are a few fundamentals that are incredibly important, and you do have to understand accounting, and it helps to get out and talk to consumers and start thinking like a consumer in many ways in certain industries and all of that. But it just doesn't require advanced learning. And uh, I, I, I certainly, you know, I didn't want to go to a college, so I, I, I don't know whether I, I would have done better or worse if I'd uh, just quit after high school, uh, you know, and read the books I read and all of that. Uh, I think that if you run into a, a few great teachers and they really change the way you see the world to some degree, you know, you're lucky and you can find them in, you can find them in academia and, and you can find them in ordinary life. And uh, I've, I've been extraordinarily lucky in having great teachers, in, including Charlie. I mean, Charlie's been a wonderful teacher. And, you know, the, any place you can find somebody that, that gives you insights into things you didn't understand before, maybe makes you a better person than you would have been before, you know, you get, that's very lucky and you want to make the most of it. If you, if you can find it in academia, make the most of it. And if you can find it in the rest of your life, make the most of it. Charlie? Well, when you found Ben Graham, he was unconventional. And he was very smart. And, of course, that was very attractive to you. And then when you found out it worked and you could make a lot of money by sitting on your ass, <laughs> of course, you were an instant convert. And, and... And so it still the, appeals to me, actually. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but the world changed before he died. Bill Graham, I mean, I mean, Ben Graham recognized that the exact way he sought undervalued companies wouldn't necessarily work for all times under all conditions. And and that's certainly the way it worked for us. We gradually morphed into trying to buy the better companies when they were underpriced instead of the lousy companies when they were underpriced. And, and of course, that worked pretty well for us. And, and, but, and Ben Graham, he, he outlived the, the game that he played personally most of the time. He lived to see most of it fade away. I mean, just to find some company that's selling for one third of its working capital and figure out it could easily be liquidated and distribute $3 for every dollar of market price. Lots of luck if you can find those in the present markets. And, and if you can find them, they're so small that Berkshire wouldn't find them of any use anyway. So we, we've had to learn a different game. And that's a lesson for all the young people in the room. If you're going to live a long time, you have to keep learning. Yeah. What you formerly knew is never enough. So if you don't learn to constantly revise your earlier conclusions and get better ones, why, you are, I always use the same metaphor. You're like a one legged man in an ass kicking contest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. If anybody has suggestions for another metaphor, send them to me. <laughs> <laughs> Graham, incidentally, one, one point, important point Graham was not scalable. I mean, you could not do with really big money. Uh, and when I worked for Graham Newman Corp, here he was, the, the dean of all analysts, and, you know, it, he was an intellect above all others around that time. But our, the investment fund was $6 million, and the, 
and the partnership that worked in tandem with with the investment company also had about six million dollars in it. So we had twelve million bucks. We were we were working with. Now you can make adjustments for inflation, but and everything. But it was it was just a tiny amount. It wasn't it wasn't really scalable. And and the the truth is Graham didn't care because he really wasn't interested in making a lot of money for himself. Uh, so it had no reason to want to find something that could go on and on and become larger and larger. And and uh, uh, so. The utility of Chapter 8 in terms of looking at stocks as a business is of enormous value. The utility of Chapter 20 about a margin of safety is of enormous value. But that's not complicated stuff. I finally figured out why the teachers of corporate finance often teach a lot of stuff that's wrong. When I had some eye, eye troubles very early in life, I consulted a very famous eye doctor. And I realized that his place of business was doing a totally obsolete cataract operation. They were still cutting with a knife after better procedures had been invented. And I said, why are you in a great medical school performing absolute obsolete operations? And he said, Charlie, it's such a wonderful operation to teach. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what happens in corporate finance. They get these formulas, and it's a fine teaching experience. You give them a formula, you present the problem, they use the formula. It's, you get a real feeling of worthwhile activity. <laughs> There's only one trouble, it's all balderdash. Yeah, whenever you hear a theory described as elegant, watch out. You know, right. <laughs>